It is January the 28th, 2023, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. George, George Nussbaumer, by the way, he's from Austria, the guy who speaks our intro. So, um, and he's, and he's done one for another podcast that I also do. Great guy. Um, this is the future of photography. I'm Chris. We have Adrian and Jeremiah. Hi there. Hello. Greetings. How's everyone? Greetings, earthlings. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> uh, splendid. Thank you very much. Splendid. That is good. That's nice splendid. to hear. Splendid. Um, yeah. Welcome to a splendid episode of the future of photography. Um, we we were debating what we want to talk about today, and then I brought up the idea of maybe going over a few news items, just stuff from from the different newsreels. Um, a tiny little sliver of AI, but not too much. Um, and then we'll talk about a new sensor, and we will talk about digital eye contact. How about that? Oh, that's so funny. That digital so eye contact. I almost chose that. I, digital so eye said, contact. Uh, yeah. So let's so let's start. Chose. Let's start. Let's start with a, with a, with the AI adjacent. Oh, no, I'm going to go down a tangent things. straight away. Digital eye contact. Right. When you said that, I thought of the Latin use of the word digit, meaning finger. Right. So I then had a mental <laughs> image of an eye on the end of my finger that I could like waggle at the camera. <laughs> Just like there we go. This digital eye contact. Yeah. No. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> but. Uh, that that, that gives me another idea. You know these cameras that don't have that on, only are a camera and don't have a screen and buttons and stuff. That you mean a camera? <laughs> the, the things that you, that you remote control. You can have five of those on the tip, tips of your finger and create a weird device that way. That would be interesting. That. Anyway, um, you guys have heard of these weird lawsuits against stable diffusion and stuff. The, 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 the artists going and, and we have talked about this in the past and it's, it's a kind of a uh, I think our stance is pretty clear um, about this and it's the way the the artists who do uh, who, who, who sue made it sound was like the entire art scene is up in arms um, I found one that I didn't even have to look for it um, there's an artist DG Spicer he's a He's a developer, a game developer, he's a musician, and he's a digital artist. And what he's done is he's given his digital art away. But not just his art, but he has um, created a model with all his art styles in it. So um, you can download this model and you can create images this way based on his art. How about that? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think we're not too far away from being able to create our own models just on the desktop. In other words, you know, b between all of us, let's just say, you know, I probably have in my uh, Lightroom 150,000 images all kind of banked, that, right. you know, and every, you know, and tons of negatives. It would be really interesting to create a model purely of my own work and then generate stuff out of it. But then would you give it away? That's the question. I may give some of it away. I mean, in a way, I do give away whatever I kind of put up. It's not even great quality to give away. You know, people can do what they want if they steal my work from Instagram, but mm -hmm. they can't represent it in a gallery as being their own. They can use it as they see fit. But, you know, I think artists who sue um, are... Uh, in it, they're, they're not looking at the big picture. I think that uh, it's very easy not to be included in any model, and that's just to take all your work off the internet in every possible way, hashtags, right. anything. In other words, and don't allow anybody in a gallery with a camera, uh, make sure nobody posts your work. And, you know, in 50 years, you will be forgotten and irrelevant because if you're not part of the ongoing uh, model of artists working now, uh, you know, yes, you'll have, you'll be protected and no one will, will um, copy your style. And by the way, style is not something that can be copyrighted. So I, I don't right. quite understand the now, lawsuits. Here's, here's the interesting bit. Um, because uh, DG Spicer didn't just give away the models with his art, but he put them under a license. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, the, and and the licensing is is 
has been around. We, we have copyright. We have the Creative Commons that allows you to specify in which way your creation can be used. But now with uh, all the all the AI, the machine learning, there are new requirements and there are new licenses popping up. Mm -hmm. And one of those is um, is the one that uh, DJ uh, DG Spicer put his models under and it's called the open rail m license so um i don't know how much teeth it has but um it's pretty much it's pretty much a license uh, rail stands for Re responsible ai license and it's um it's been written to allow developers to restrict to to restrict the use of their uh, ai technology and to um well, it's it's about how, what what you can do with it. It's similar to what we know from Creative Commons, but it is specific to AI. So it has specific um, things in it that that pertain to AI. The M Open Rail M. The M stands for model. There's other AI stuff like algorithms and so on that um, you can license by a different kind of uh, Open Rail or Rail license. And the Open in Open Rail M stands for um, that is uh, open source adjacent. So it's an open license to give away things. I'm wondering if the, uh, with the adoption <clears throat> of blockchain uh, for photographers and any artist, when it's common enough and one could attach um, smart contracts to every possible online or when I call online, decentralized online. So people can use it, and if there is any um, commerce, it's automatically, um, mm. you know, sent out through the exchanges, uh, those that will remain. But, uh, but I, do th I, I do think that there is an advantage to a blockchain um, integration of licenses that are protected, um, you know, once they become widespread, right? Yeah, I think I think I think it hinges on adoption. Yeah. I I don't doubt that there are advantages uh, using technologies like that, but it's got to be um, widely adopted. To make it has to be difference. widely adopted for it to make sense and to work. Yeah. So, it yeah. feels like we're in a bit of a, a wild west of, of oh yes of licensing and 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 copyright and things like that. Now, I'm I'm all for artists getting credit and being able to earn a living uh, by, by doing their art because I firmly believe that it furthers the cause of humanity right and and it helps us evolve as a, as a civilization so definitely I want to live in a world where artists can be a thing and be a and be a viable business in their own right if that's not too clunky a way of expressing it um, I don't feel we're quite there yet with all of this new stuff. Um, and so, and globally, we certainly don't act with one mind, do we? You know, what, what might hold in, in the world that the three of us circle, in which you might call, for want of a better term, the Western world. Um, you know, there, is, uh, there are plenty of places where people wouldn't worry too much about licensing and, and things like that. So, so uh, it's, uh, it feels like we've got a ways to go yet. Yeah, it's interesting, I mean I mean, there, there's the balance the, of, you know, on one hand, all information should be free, that kind of battle cry from the 90s. <clears throat> and then uh, who owns what and for how long in terms of copyright? That's always the big discussion. In other words, the copyright laws, which are different internationally, right? Oh, um, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and they have different, um, let's say, different... Different uh, goals, yeah. Different, different, yeah, different goals. goals. If we if we look at the American copyright, there's um, there's a very commercial slant to it. If we look yeah. at the French, French uh, is more ownership. And the French and German uh, Urheberrecht is the name for it, which yeah. is uh, which means the the creator's right, which is more uh, targeted towards the arts side of things, and commerce yeah. is, is only attached to that. So it's yeah, it's difficult. But uh, DG Spicer just deliberately used an open rail m license which means uh he ha he he's giving it this away pretty much under certain conditions so he's not even looking for any um 
any financial compensation he's looking so, so it's very interesting so I, I understand that a lot of these lawsuits have been the fact that um artists feel that these large models that we're all you know celebrating now have been trained using their imagery it's and, about copyright uh, without yeah. having it been it having been licensed so what is the models that this person is actually giving away what are they well, it's not the artwork that's underpinned the training. No, the, it is uh, so. It is the model that you can use to create artwork in his style. So he trained a model on his own styles, different styles. And now you can, you can use these models with stable diffusion and you can input a prompt such as um, um, a landscape in the style of DJ Spicer. Okay, and so that's will interesting. Then so, so it's it. So you could, if I if I wanted to create something in his style, and I ha and I was better informed than I am, I could I could use that model yes. uh, to to generate imagery based around his style. Okay, yes. um, and he has five or six different styles programmed into this model or trained into this model. So um, you can you can recreate art that looks like he made it. So his That's, style, he, he's giving his style away, which... Yeah, but yeah. by the way, his style, one could, if one did a very deep dive on his style specifically... Sure. I'm sure you'll find 50 global <laughs> artists who work in a similar style. Oh, yes, there, yes. <clears throat> I me. mean... There, there is no unique style to art. Every artist is built on the backs of... Every artist's style is built on the backs of those who came before. And you he know. has cer certainly achieved one thing. And that is, we are talking about him. So, <laughs> and by the way, uh, it's he will give away his digital um, work, models, etc. But should he get, you know, a million followers and a big groundswell of of love from the general population, and has a show of printed work, those will become valuable. Yes. So that. There, it's the combination, we're seeing this more and more, of the connection, and I believe 23, 24 will be the years where we'll see more of a connection between analog and digital work, how they, they feed each other in different ways. Right. Okay, on to the next item. Um, Adrian, you brought this one, the S1 multispectral sensor. What the, what on earth is that about? <laughs> Well, it's the future of photography, quite simply. Um, obviously, <laughs> obviously. So, so, so one of the great things about this time of year, um, if you're going to do a technology news show, is that, of course, we've just had CES, uh, the, the Consumer Electronics Show. And there's loads and loads of gadgets announced there. And there's loads and loads of speculative things. So, so I had a quick look and this one caught my eye. Um, there's very, very little detail on this, but apparently there was a, sh uh, a show stand and they could demo it against an iPhone and they could show that in a variety of different lighting conditions, you know, white balance and so forth, that actually this new sensor, with it, it seems to have four or five sensors and it's sensing different places in the spectrum and it's, it's going to be able to uh, give you better pictures than your phone can. <laughs> So the I've I've looked at the website I've checked it out and uh, they say okay your no, your normal sensor has three colors red green and blue and uh, then it mixes everything out of those and they claim that their sensor captures sixteen different wavelengths and uh, that makes it better all around and they have are already working with um, smartphone manufacturers and by twenty twenty four they are expected to have their sensors in, in actual phones but uh, I've I've not seen any technical detail nothing it's just the claims of that this thing will also uh, according to their website it will also help you diagnose skin conditions because it can see i don't know things that grow stuff. and stuff <laughs> stuff um stuff. It, can see stuff. it will it will also an analyze your skin and get, uh, be able to give you targeted um cosmetics recommendations no, that's covered what i've up. seen <laughs> cover it up <laughs> right um <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we have we've seen different kinds of sensor sensor things. I mean, look at Fuji and the X-Trans sensor, which is like they they extended the three base colors to like four, five. I don't know. So they changed uh, the classical. Oh, it's, it's the pattern, array. isn't it? With the, the X-Trans is the pattern. So yeah, they still have just uh, red, green, and blue, but the pattern of those is different. Um, isn't it runs, there uh, runs over sixteen pixels instead or was of it, four? Or pixels. was it Sony who added another? Oh no! On screens, they added another, a third, a fourth color, a different tone of green to be able to 
get deeper into that level. So uh, there have been efforts of uh, expanding the the color space of devices, I think both cameras and displays to extend into some areas where they have their weaknesses. So I just I just wonder, is this thing gonna th- thing gonna see at night? Is this gonna be infrared? Is this gonna be UV and all the stuff around? Is it gonna see as good as I don't know a bee or uh, some animals do? Uh, do you think is this fundamentally a hardware um, optic or a software optic? I think it's hardware. The 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 the, 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 the skin sensors. analysis on, on the, thing the, the, is in in the web page. Uh, yeah, if you want to bring it up again, Chris, there's the, there's there's a picture of a board which has several sensors on it, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, there we go. It seems to have five sensors on it. This this demo board, so quite what it's sensing um it it doesn't give any detail i you know i it it just tickled me as a a thing it's been a little while since we've heard of somebody saying you know they're going to reinvent cell phone cameras um it could be a couple of years even um so you know it's good that somebody's having a go uh and uh i don't know um it would be intriguing um uh, but you know i guess if it is particularly hardware based, I think they might struggle because most of the stuff that phone manufacturers want to do these days is software based, isn't it? So, yeah. So, so that's that's a challenge. Um, well, they it, they promise interesting things. They say like a, a doctor might be able to tell how a wound is healing without requiring an office visit just by you pointing mm-hmm. the camera at it, that kind of stuff. So, might be something to it. Maybe not in smartphones. Maybe in a medical device of sorts to to analyze things. So, yeah. Who knows? It, it's Who just knows? It, it could be a, a complete, you know, uh, well, not a fabrication because they had a demo at CES, so they must have spent some money to do that. So they must think they're onto something, you know. It, um, so there, there's got to be something there, but whether or not it'll make it to market, I don't know. But hey, you know, it's you know, not everything that people demo comes to life, does it? So, oh, the um, this the, there was this AR. Just I just remember this AR contact lens. Have you heard of that? Have, have you even talked about it here? Like a Mojo, a little contact lens, and it contained a, a screen and a battery and a, a motion sensor and stuff like that. So it could project things into the space. Was really tiny, and the prototype was shown maybe three quarters of a year, half a year ago. Um, they just folded because they ran out of money and they're not getting new money. So, to, I have a question stops. for Jeremiah about this actually, right? So, having last year had both my eyes doctored so that I can now see for the first time in my grown life, um, most of my life, um, without having to wear glasses, I suddenly have a different point of view on all of these augmented reality things. It's like I do not want to put on another <laughs> pair of glasses, <laughs> nor do I. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do I. It's bad enough that I need glasses for distance now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I said the same thing about wearing a watch because I didn't wear a watch for the longest time, and now I'm either. quite I'm quite happy to put a watch on. So yeah, I so I will. I will. We'll, we'll I bought an Apple Watch during lockdown to try and keep me, and and as soon as I was out and about, I was like, no, I'm putting on my you know my clockwork Omega watch again because that's the watch I really like. I never really liked the Apple Watch. I liked so you you're so you're a watch guy. You're a watch. I, guy. I only have the one actually, and I would um, so uh, and that that is absolutely more than sufficient for me. Um, uh, it, so I wouldn't not in a, a collector in any way because I literally only but have the, the one watch. Who can live with a with a thing on their arm that only shows the time and that not. <laughs> even that precisely <laughs> I, I agree with chris 100%. Ah, so, so the, the irony of it is of course is that actually my watch needs servicing because it hasn't been serviced for about five years <laughs> and it would probably cost as much to service the watch as it will to buy a new apple watch <laughs> so i can i can i can see how how much charge i have in the car where where the wind is coming from what, how long yeah, it takes till the till the casserole in the oven is ready do you know actually a little app on your watch that shows you where the wind is coming from probably will really improve the quality of your selfies right your moody pop star selfies where the wind is ruffling <laughs> through your hair. I mean, that, that, that's, that, I can see the utility in that. I think, I think it's a very, a very, very photocentric feature, that one. Yeah. You have no, great here, hair, Chris, No, here, but... here it, means, it means we have the choice if, if we want to hear the noise from the autobahn or if we want to smell the horses from the other side so no. of the village. So that's, that's what it tells me. Um, okay. Last but not least on the list of things is digital eye contact. And it's not the one with your digits. 
Um, so just recently, um, NVIDIA talked or, or, or um, um, presented, um, oh, what's the name again? Maxine, NVIDIA Maxine, which is a series of software and they're on their graphics cards and is using AI, of course. Uh, and it does a lot of audio trickery, to, like it removes uh, reverb from rooms in audio, and it makes it makes conversations like these easier without having to have specific micro special microphones and ear headphones and stuff. Like you, it it optimizes things, but it also does that on the video side, and it does something that um, Apple has done for a while in FaceTime. And the, the the thing is, you tend to look under the camera when you talk to someone on the other side of the screen. Uh, so, yeah, you look at their face on the screen, but you're not looking at the camera. And, of course, that eye contact thing is uh, is important. And so Apple has done that for oh, a couple of years now. Like they, 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 they took slightly, that away. I thought they, they removed it. No, 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 no. They they said they would, and now they have just secretly snuck it in. A year <laughs> oh, really? Ago. I don't yeah, really yeah, use it's in FaceTime there. very much. I think the only person I ever really do FaceTime with is my mum. So, yeah. yeah uh, but but it does that. It, it, it lifts the, the gaze slightly upwards towards the camera. It's very subtle. It does the job. And uh, actually, to be honest... Uh, when it initially it. was was presented, it was uh, I was a bit freaked out, but now I looked at it and it's like, yeah, who cares? It's <laughs> it's nothing <laughs> special. Yeah. Now, but the, but the eyes are the windows to the soul, Chris. I mean, it's like you can't muck about with that kind of stuff on a screen that is 140 pixels in size. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Yeah. If you, so, that's a good point. If you're talking about like a 10 pixel shift in in the positioning of the eyes as it, as the video is rendered, that's so. So the thing is, NVIDIA has uh, has has um, uh, released their Maxine suite of things that does the audio and the video fixing. And, um, well, they have... Uh, let me bring that up here. Um, they have this... Do we see a demo here? Um, this, this thing where you look... You don't look at the camera, but the camera shows you as if you were looking at the camera, straight at the camera. And that is... Yeah, that's now available, um, I think, for, for PCs. Um, not sure how that will work on a Mac because NVIDIA cards are not supported on Macs, but um, then I don't know if, if you would need it if you use FaceTime because that's already built in. But yeah, so I've seen some online examples that are fairly strong. Like someone is really looking, clearly looking to the side and the thing fixes the gaze and it's yeah i mean you know like uh, photoshop in, in their neural um filters um I'll allow for a certain amount of adjustment of the eyes and the gaze um it's something that i've i've used not i haven't tried it for still actual photos i, I tend to use it more for ai adjustment because eyes are always a little bit of a bugaboo um, but that's, you know, that's something that, that would be an interesting thing to build into a camera if you wanted to, you know, it's the old, everybody grouped together. Okay. Look at the camera and smile. And there's always somebody who's like, and if you can just. <laughs> so here's, here's one for you, Jeremiah. Mm. Um, when you shoot a movie, what is the one thing that actors should completely avoid at all times normally when it comes to being in front of a camera not knowing your lines <laughs> okay that's the one thing but in relation <laughs> between the actor and the camera um there's this concept of the fourth wall true yes the fourth can, wall can you is... can you briefly explain what that means uh when an actor looks directly at the camera it is called breaking the fourth wall and it, it takes you out of an objective reality of the story you're telling into a more subjective reality integrated with the subject who's looking at you and you. So it's letting you in on a secret and it takes you, in a way, out of the flow. That doesn't mean that the movie is going to be um, worse for it as long as it's built in and there's a reason for it. Right. Gen generally speaking, 
like for someone like me, I like to keep what we call the eye line, which is the um, relationship of one actor who would be, say, off camera or slightly blurred in front looking at the actor who's on camera and keep it as tight as possible. Uh, it's not always possible to do that in the, um, you know, in the kind of in the battle to get your days done. Sometimes you have to be a little off axis and sometimes that off axis uh, works for a better aesthetic. Um, right. But but generally speaking, emotionally, the tighter the eye line, the more visible the connection. Right. And but you don't but want that, that connection to be with the viewer. You want it to be with the story within. Right. So the, so so the actor looking straight at the camera is as long as it's not uh, helpful for the story it's a no no pretty much um, Yeah I mean on documentaries it's perfectly great Oh we've seen this somebody. and in the office the office for example yeah. uses that as a as a st <clears throat> stylistic sure. element but yeah. in most movies that doesn't happen unless you have something like Nvidia Mixine what they <laughs> what people have done is they've gone really creative yeah. and said oh we have a tool now let's run some movies through that and have actors in the movies and I'm trying to get this to run uh, and 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 take take music uh, take movie scenes I gotta reload this one uh, take a couple of movie scenes run them through this and uh, see what happens it's okay. very disquieting I saw this it <laughs> is it is super disquieting when you have um, <laughs> Like, don't look at me, please. When you have Robert De Niro. De Niro staring into the camera while saying something. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it. it's it's movies that we know. Um, here, The Godfather, um, glancing over to you into the camera. It is very disquieting. <laughs> The, the Javier and, Bardez one is very, very in the shop there. That that's really spooky. Is that that's from No Country for Old Men, I assume. Yes. yes, um, yes. And and he plays a very, very scary character in that movie. As as quiet and slow as that movie is, it's a it, it's a scary character. The best By depiction the way, of a psychopath. <laughs> And I, Jaws is always I'm, a good one as well. Yeah, I'm convinced that this software could be reverse engineered to do the following because sometimes you have a really good take, and just for whatever reason, we call we call it the actor just caught the camera. In other words, yeah. just an inadvertent glance at the camera. Oh, you mean really you effective. could make him make him undo this in Correct. one way or another? Yes, and I think that would be very helpful on certain shots. So breaking the fourth wall or restoring the fourth wall? Restoring the fourth wall would be my vote. And I, I would imagine that it would be relatively simple to a reverse engineer. Yeah, probably. I think... I Just think run it is, backwards. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the best creative examples or best examples of creative use of a new technology because, I mean, who doesn't want um, Robert De Niro staring at you while he's talking to someone else. And on you know, re real world use, right? As a slightly, um, slightly higher volume but lower production value, this could be an excellent tool for vloggers, right? Because the number of vloggers who post oh, yeah. videos of them looking at their flappy out screen rather than down the lens of their camera, yeah, right. that, that that could be a really key thing. There's a market for that, definitely. All right. So that was the news items for today. Um, how about some pictures? The future of photography is looking rosy then, isn't it? If those are our oh. news items, it, 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 we're just on, onwards and upwards. <laughs> yes, it's everything, everything is, I, I'm, everything is I'm awesome. very curious about the kind of skunk works in these camera uh, manufacturer designers of how they are looking at the world of AI <clears throat> um, and... The resources of kind of continuous continuous connection to the web, built in to the chips in their cameras. Um, it'll it'll change the the work uh, the field of of um, visual effects. No? Well, the, 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 the and, effects and houses gaming, do gaming. do all these things already anyway. Like they fix sure. glances and they fix. Uh, they do. It costs stuff. a lot more. It costs a lot more, so they will maybe do different things. You know, on, uh, just by way of conversation, I was uh, speaking to our uh, effects house, our visual effects house, <clears throat> this week, and we were talking just about rotoscoping in terms of removing some people from some existing imagery that I would want to use more of a stock shot. 
So it would be something that, uh, an older shot that had people moving through, it'd want to remove the people maybe. Put, and used to be that would be very, very costly, but that's something that I can, I can do right on my computer with Runway ML. I mean, you yep. just, it, it, it's a simple to R do rotoscop something. Rotoscoping is the process where you cut something out in a moving picture. So yeah. the, the, the whole the whole frame that cuts it out has to move with whatever you're doing. So. Yeah, 24 times a second or 25. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's all becoming very, very inexpensive, um, which is a joy. Yeah. What, what, what might be quite good, right, is to have something that, like a slider. So I'm imagining now a future version of something like Luminar, right, tool, tool for editing photos. And you have a slider, and instead of sending, instead of changing the tone or the color and thing, it just slides your eyes left or right, right? And so you can slide these, well, slide the size of the slider. Yeah, that's, the already, the, that's already that's possible. Already, it's built into Photoshop, pretty yeah. much. Can you do that? Yes. In Photoshop? Right. Yes. Okay. You can also re repose people with a, like there's a puppet system available, so you can change someone's pose and stuff. Yeah, sure. Or or, or move their head a little. Yeah. Yes, I think we're into all kinds of changes. Also, you know, um, there's something I, I was going to save it maybe for next week, but if we, since we don't usually talk about music, I'll just throw it out. Uh, music. There's a music ML, I think um, that. You, you type in a prompt and you go, you know, reggaeton, you know. Oh, yeah, there's sev violin. several of these. Yes, yes. Um, there's one Furge. by Google, but they, have, they haven't released it. They're a bit cagey about it. That's the one I just read I'm about, about it today. About. Yes, there are some really good examples out there. Yes. Yeah, and I think maybe for songwriters, not so great. But for jingle writers, imagine training a model on thousands and thousands and thousands of jingles, which are you know, 15 seconds. I'm pretty seconds. sure that has already happened. All yeah. right. Anyway. Anyway, on to the picks of the week. Adrian, you brought us... What the... What, eh, eh, what are these? <laughs> <laughs> they, look, they, look like, they look like a welder's goggles. They do look thing. like... Well, yes, yeah, so, so welder's goggles combined with something you'd see a soldier wearing night vision goggles in a movie or something like that. Um, so this is uh, this is another uh, announcement from CES actually, um, but there's a company called Beale Glasses and have been working with Panasonic, and the idea behind these these are a prototype, I believe, um, that uh, they could help people with partial sight, especially with tunnel vision, um, by providing uh, computational cameras as, essentially mm. uh, as as a pair of mm. glasses pair of spectacles wow. uh, and help people with partial sight be able to see better and be able to navigate the world better you know, improve depth of field you know, um, field of view that sort of thing so i like i picked this one up because uh, you know, again you know, very early days it's in the research phase um uh, but actually you know using computational photography to to help people in that kind of way um could be awesome I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what what are these glasses exactly doing. Uh, the press release talks about uh, uh, correcting for tunnel vision, um, so it would give people better peripheral vision, and therefore ah, they would okay. be better able to navigate, be able to see things in peripheral vision, and yeah, therefore do like not get knocked over by a bus and things like that. Um, Which so, is helpful, but, yeah. but it doesn't uh, it doesn't really talk about the technology as such. Okay, okay, all right. Well. Hmm? Oh, yeah, cool. something to watch out for. Your yeah, medical uses for computational photography that impact, yeah, that impact the actual individual yeah. people in a day to day basis. Yeah, not just you know, not just big machines in hospital basements. Very true. Uh, Jeremiah, do you have a pick? I do. It's there. Where's the Where's the link? I don't see a link. Oh, there is a link on. Huh. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I tell Tell me what it is. I'll Google it. Oh God, it's a missing hold link. On. Hold on, hold on. Maybe, um, it's the missing link. No. The missing link. That's we found it. No, something moved. No, that is no. That's mine. that's the wrong one. Uh, okay, I'll I'll bring mine up. You no, have here the it last. Is, here it is. You have the last is. word. Here it is. Uh, I got it. I got it. Sorry for your uh, all these people who are listening to me being very very boring. I might uh, edit. I might edit it. <laughs> oh, anyway, not. it's called. I'm not. sorry. It's called sense censusatlas.com. More messed up. I have too many senses. At, oh yeah, there we go. Senses Atlas. It's a it's a curated photo site 
that has very interesting approaches, especially in photography. Um, their choices are, I guess, um, to the brutalist, maybe, to the machines, to, you know, it's worth exploring. Is what I'm so saying. It's, a, it's, a, it's a photography, you know, it's not a sharing I site, it, it's a, no, it has it's articles art. about photography. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, they have all kinds of illustration, painting, cinema, oh, I you see, know, I see. different place on earth. But the photography section is always interesting in terms of their curation. Um, it's not the, the usual stuff. And, oh, uh, that's, so that's a style I can... I can Yeah, I it's quite. I, I find it quite inspiring and inspired in terms of Here we have obsolete health. industrial structures, yeah. time machines, ghost Geo towns. Geothermals, really beautiful. Under tree canopies. Okay, this one was worth waiting for. Thank, Thank you. you. Asian, what was that? Open this one up. Census Atlas. Asian mega ports. Oh, this yeah. is awesome. Look at that. Okay. Okay, all is well with the world. I like this. I like this too as well. Yes, I should, I like I should dive into this one. Yeah. This is this is the in industrial huge structures showing you the real, the real scale of things. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. I'm a fan. Me I'm too. Fan. Fan Thank of you. Big industrial, big machines, odd things, brutalist architecture, abandoned hotels, all great. All right, um, so my pick is a Twitter thread by Isabel Baldwin, who is a film photographer. And what she has done is she has looked over Oscar-nominated movies over the last, well, I'd say, three, two, three years and uh, picked those ones out that have been shot on Kodak film. So um, that's a part of the future of photography because film is not, going away and uh, we see this in like Babylon in 2022 or um, let's say The Sound of Metal Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has been shot on Kodak film Little Women um, La La they, Land Don't Look Up You know the up. issue the issue with shooting on film and features is uh, most of these films are high budget movies Oh, yes, they are. They are. Clearly are. Yes. The irony is to shoot film, you need an extra um, big budget. Um, and you have to work slower than the norm now. Yeah. And, and so that, that is, it sort of um, reversed the overall sensibility and having shot on film and all manner of digital as well. It's a different aesthetic. It's a different pace. And it's quite beautiful uh, when you see projected imagery i think the the difference is when it's captured digitally or where where it's photographed uh, on film analog then it's captured and then it's distributed online is that difference outside <laughs> is that of the bokeh so because and that's that's a big question other than the process which shooting film is a little bit different Yeah, and then that's that's I think one of the things. The process is a different one. You have uh, a different discipline, I guess. Um, and it's also, as you said, it's only the big names: Spielberg, uh, Spike Lee, uh, Tarantino, Nolan. Like, like, yeah. Yes, it's only it's only a, a few ones. The reason I like this is because it helps Kodak keep their film production going. Absolutely. There are big contracts in place that that uh, that that mean that Kodak is going to continue to maintain their machinery and keep the knowledge in house and so on. And that benefits us film photographers if we want to buy a roll of um, Portra or a roll of Triax or something. It certainly does. Because because the 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 hobby air quotes, hobby photographers, film photographers, um, they don't get generate the volume that that uh, that Hollywood needs for these films. So I'd love to see the numbers on that, because I know that, you know, some, some years ago, three, four, five years ago, you know, there were, you know, in, it was in the news that, you know, actually some of the Hollywood studios had to sign big multi-year contracts with Kodak to, in order to keep the film production running. Um, but now, as a consumer facing massively rising prices in, in the cost of just buying a roll of film, 
Um, you can't argue anymore, I don't think, that supply outstrips demand because you know, the, the prices are going up and up and up and supply chain challenges are, are, are impacting all the manufacturers. So it'd be really interesting to see how the economics of that has changed since those big studio contracts were signed um, and see, see what's different. Because Kodak is investing now, isn't it, in, in new manufacturing plant and things like that. So um, it's, uh, and people as well. So it'd be, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, um try to find someone from Kodak to talk about these things <laughs> probably not easy the one thing that uh, I that has come out over the last year um, two parts out of three are already on YouTube is um, smarter every day um, the guy has a YouTube channel for well for learning things and he had a, a, a an interesting very deep look into the Kodak factory in Rochester. So he, he got a tour in there. Um, he looked at how they produce film. Again, thir third part is still out outstanding, but uh, um, we'll hopefully get that one soon. So um, there's a lot that goes into making film, and he documents that from the from the making the film base, the plastic from granulates to coating the film to cutting it up and, and putting it in the distribution this is um that's a super involved process so anyway i'll link to that in the show notes as well and with that i guess we have have we have we missed anything important i don't think so don't, don't no. think so don't think so i think it's all right. Look forward so. to talking about music next week, if that's, <laughs> if, if that's what we do, because there's plenty of similarities with the world of music, uh, I think, um, but also differences as well. Using images to generate songs. Well, also yeah. the, 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 the business side of it, we we're talking about licensing and things like that, yeah. which is the similarities and differences there. So it's, a, it's an interesting comparison, I think. So, so maybe we'll, we'll branch out next week to yeah. talk about... Uh, the yeah, sound the of things the, the parallels between <laughs> the visual and the audio yep anyway we'll be back in a week from now you can find us online at thefutureofphotography.com and uh, yeah everyone take care and go out and take amazing photos and right? look at the camera see you then take care bye 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 you've been listening to the future of photography Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Music